remember that compassion and respect extends beyond humans to all living beings. Here today to share easy ways you can support animal rights is freshman Jamie Minden. When I was little, my mother really needed some alone time. I was one of those needy children who spent every waking moment, and most of the sleeping ones too, physically attached to my mom. So, one morning after about three years of this, my mom decides that she really needs a shower. So, she put me in front of the television to watch Charlotte's Web. I fell in love with the animals on that screen. The pigs that rolled in the mud, the cats washing themselves in the barn, and the horse that really spoke to me and the voice of Robert Radford, but I was forming a connection with that innocent farm story and loving it all the way up until the end, when Charlotte died. My mom got out of the shower to find me absolutely bawling, and needless to say, that was the last shower she took for a while. Later, when I was about nine, I joined a local 4-H club to learn more about agriculture and taking care of animals. I started out with the pygmy goats and eventually moved on to the miniature horse project where I was old enough. It was at about that time that they brought cows to the farm. Their names were Morpheus and Ramses, and they were the sweetest creatures I had ever met. They had these big, kind brown eyes that were full of so many innocent questions, yet such a sense of wisdom and knowledge. They were wary of people at first, but every time I went to take care of the horses, I visited them. First, I put my hand out for them to smell, and they would cautiously plod it over, look at me for a moment, then start licking me with their slimy, rough tongues. They knew their own names and learned to recognize my voice, coming when I called. Those two would see me squat in front of their stall door, and they would have a little race to see who could get there first. We were all taught in 4-H never to go in to other animals' paddocks without proper training, and it's very against the rules to do so, and for good reason, but... One day, I climbed over the fence and into their stall. I formally apologize to any 4-H members out here, but remember, at 13, my decision-making skills were less than exemplary, and I wanted to meet my new friends face to face. Mo nuzzled my knee, and Ramses licked me, both of them dancing around like joyful puppies, trying to play with me. It was a powerful moment, but I didn't realize its importance until later. I got busy for a few weeks, and when I returned, Mo and Ramses were gone. I had known that this was going to happen. It happened to the pigs and the lambs, too. But it didn't stop that wave of shock from rushing over me as I finally came to terms with what the phrase going to market meant. Meat is murder is the slogan of many animal rights campaigns, but what really are animal rights? Obviously, I don't mean the right to vote or drive a car. I'm talking about the simple principle of believing that animals feel fear, pain, and joy, and that they should be protected from suffering. Maybe animal rights is not such a radical idea, but this concept has been given a negative connotation in our society. Why? I think that it's because of a group I like to call extremist vegan organizers, or EVOs for short. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing but respect for vegans. Most of them are just normal people with scarily good self-control. But EVOs are different. They set the bar way too high for our society and expect everyone to agree with them after being shamed and shouted at. See? Doesn't feel very good, does it? EVOs care a lot about animal rights, just like I do. But their extremist scare tactics turn people away from the animal rights cause because people feel ashamed, and then angry, because why should I get yelled at when everyone else does the same thing? Eventually, people decide to regard the whole concept as a joke. Now, clearly, I'm not an EVO. But if I explain the process of raising and killing cows like Mo and Ramses, I might be able to give you a better idea of how we can make progress in real ways. Because, let's be honest, meat tastes way too good. But I doubt any of you want to cause animals pain, so I'm sure we would all be a little more open to policy changes that would require farmers to provide room for chickens to spread their wings and keep their beaks and talons whole. Mo and Ramses began their lives when their mothers licked their new eyes open 
and began providing them with milk, preparing to spend the next 10 months keeping their sons close by. But for the majority of the world's cows, this is not the case. Most calves are pumped full of chemicals and antibiotics and taken from their mothers just a few hours after birth. Cow mums who have a strong sense of bond with their calf go insane, throwing themselves against barn doors for weeks, trying to get out and bring their baby home. They will go through this process of birthing and losing a calf twice more, spending the time when they should have been nursing hooked up to milking machines along with thousands of other grieving mothers. Their children fare no better. Daughters getting shoved into the same system as their moms and sons slaughtered for veal or conventional meat. Mo and Ramses were very lucky. Veal cows spend their entire life of six months confined in a wooden pen with no room to move. Cows farmed for other types of meat are stored in dirty pens and fattened up with thousands of their brethren before they are hung upside down and their throats slit. They never get the chance to breathe fresh air, and some never even see the sun. And while other species of farm animals are treated just as badly, food is only one industry of exploitation. Elephants and lions are beaten to submission in circuses. Isolated orcas forced to dance for entertainment, and rabbits, chimps, and mice are pumped with chemicals in laboratories. Foxes and ferrets are bred for fashion and squeezed into disease cages where mothers sometimes kill their offspring rather than bring their children into a world of such suffering. And let's not forget the millions of wild species now extinct because of human activities. Greed and convenience are the driving forces behind these atrocities, and usually only a few people at the top really benefit. So let's dig down to find the root of the problem. Why is it that we treat animals so badly, even today in this enlightened age? According to a recent Gallup poll, 94% of American adults believe that animals should be treated with far more respect. So it's not that we don't care. The true problem? is that no one believes that we have a say. You hear a horrible fact, then feel sorry for about 15 minutes, but think, I can't do anything about it. So you don't. And it's true. Animal cruelty won't stop. If you feel sorry for a few minutes, then go back to ignoring it. Don't just feel sorry. Do something about it. This problem is pretty immense, though, and a bit overwhelming if we start thinking about tackling it all at once. That's usually why people back off from the issue. They don't want to be thought of as EVOs and are afraid of getting laughed at. But if no one even wants to talk about it, no action happens. So do you want to help? Let's start with policy. Ethics and profit can coincide. It's not an either-or system. Chickens don't need to be confined to tiny cages, and mother cows can easily be kept near their babies without nursing them. With a little extra help from farmers, the quality of life for animals can be improved without compromising the products they produce. The most concrete and obvious way for you to make change is through laws. California, yes, our very own state, is the sixth largest economy in the world. So we have a lot of influence on agricultural laws globally. The main way we can help is by bringing voters' attention to the cause, which will provide representatives with some pressure. Soon after, we can introduce the bills they need to sign our ideas into laws. Massachusetts recently passed a revolutionary law making it illegal to sell the products of animals kept in cages. An organization called Prevent Cruelty California is trying to get our state to do the same. In fact, they're currently counting signatures that might get this issue onto our midterm ballots. I really encourage you to learn more about these possible changes in policy and to share your views, because every voice in support really makes a difference. With new technology being created as we speak, we are the builders of a world of possibilities around us. New debates about women's rights and gun laws are gaining momentum before our very eyes. The same attention needs to be brought to animal rights. Another way to change the world is to educate the people around you. 
if I tell five people who tell another five and so on, the consequences are exponential. People like me are spreading these stories not to make you feel badly, but to expose the constant cruelty happening every day in the hopes that people will unite to do something about it. As the visionary author Angela Myers once said, words matter. They're contagious, and hopeful words infect people. Transform your outlook and your vocabulary. The next time your friend wears a fur keychain on her purse, remind her of where it came from rather than complimenting it. Don't laugh the next time your coworker makes a demeaning comment about animals. Instead, stand up for your principles and tell him that it's not okay. Acts of courage like these might seem minuscule, but your influence can make a world of difference on someone else's outlook. We can use peer pressure for good and gently steer, pun intended, people away from propping up pool industries. But the most influential yet overlooked members of our society are children. Adults, you need to encourage the children in your lives to get out into the natural world. Teach them to have respect for the creatures we share this planet with. In school, I've learned from a young age about recycling, climate change, and the environment, and that's great, but not once has the issue of animal rights been mentioned. Instead, we are given frog and cat carcasses to pick apart in science. Studies show how classroom dissection actually causes children to treat animals with callousness and may even turn some kids away from taking jobs in scientific fields. Adults, you are teaching children that animal lives don't matter, that they're like lab equipment to be used for an hour then tossed in the bin. Teach kids to care, not to ignore. Finally, we need to reduce the demand for a large supply of meat. Eating less meat helps reduce animal suffering and scientists believe it may be one of the best strategies to counteract climate change. It's beneficial for your health, too. The average American eats eight ounces of meat a day, while the USDA recommends four, at most. A common excuse is that in the grand scheme of things, everyone else will continue eating animals and we can't stop them. I mean, yes, one person's eating habits aren't going to save the lives of every animal out there, but your meal choices are a big deal to the 7,000 animals consumed by the average meat eater in a lifetime. You don't have to go completely cold turkey, another pun, but you can reduce your meat intake to just one or two meals a week. If you can afford it, buy free-range chicken products and grass-fed beef and dairy. In the end, it's easy to sit back and expect that someone else will do the work, but that is not the case. We are responsible for seeing that animals are treated with respect. We carry the future on our backs, regardless of whether it is a compassionate future or a cruel one. We must remember that we are sharing this planet with animals, that it's not ours alone. Teach the world to care, love, and appreciate animals, not just as resources, but as companions in this beautiful world we live in. It will take a global movement, I know. But we can start small. Our ideas will spread, changing people's minds one by one. And before you know it, we will have changed the world. Thank you.